and and I heard the cop talk talk in terms of detainees. And then later on in Los Angeles and then in New York, I heard that again. They had begun to even use the language. And so that brought home a lot of uh, reality to me in identifying the brother on the ground with the Vietnamese or the Viet Cong, on the, in which we had just got through doing that too. And the helicopters, almost the identical thing. But now we were the D.C. In America, uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized. The police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory. And we're just not concerned about the Vietnam War per se. We are concerned about the survival of black people in this country and that we cannot survive if we go fight some yellow man in Vietnam who ain't never called us nigger. No man can speak for Negroes who tells Negroes to uh, suffer peacefully. There is no Negro in his right mind today who is going to turn the other cheek. Now they felt that by murdering Malcolm X that they would also kill his ideas. But I'm here to tell you that Malcolm X's ideas would be stronger now than they were when he was alive. We want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black communities. We want full employment for our people. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We want decent housing, fit for shelter for human beings. We want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We want all black men exempt from military service. And we want immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. We want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried by a jury of their peer group. Our people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. I think because the, the Panthers uh, captured the imagination and the energy of young black people in the cities, um, I think that they represented a real possibility or, or potential for community control. Um, I think that the government had, you know, uh, we saw the riots that occurred after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. And I think this government saw that within its own population there was a potential for a real rebellion. And I think the fact that the Panthers, the, the idea that the Panthers might lead such a rebellion and uh, was a real threat, particularly when the United States was trying to wage a war in Vietnam and trying to use black soldiers, by and large, to wage the war. They wanted to dismiss us as being uh, a street gang. Well, we certainly were not a street gang. The threat was that we were uh, a, young, a group of young people who were committed to organize into a political power base mm -hmm the poor and oppressed people throughout this uh, throughout this country. When you live in a class society, the upper classes, they're always they're in constant, constant fear of the, what they call the lower classes. The Panthers uh, wanted to uh, uh, explode the myth of the docile uh, uh, black who would turn the other cheek and say, no, we won't turn the other cheek. As a matter of fact, if you try to shoot me, I'm going to shoot back. And if you got your gun, I got mine. And, and um, uh, so, therefore, if you wanted to uh, aggress upon me, then whereas I'm not a natural and an aggressor, that I would defend myself to the hilt. And that's what, uh, that's what we were attempting to do. Well, actually, the Black Panther Party in 
total was very American phenomenon. It was very similar analytically to the Minutemen, historically. A group of local citizens who rose up to defend their community against aggression, which is what the Black Panther Party conceived itself as defending the community that blacks lived in from aggression from police forces who were hostile. We said move to a high level. We're moving to a level whereby the people are going to take over control of their destiny. They're going to take over control of their community. And the first way of doing this is dealing with the most uh, integral part of the fascist three-way oppression. We said demagogic lying politicians and avaricious greedy businessmen. And we say fascist pig cops. But the one that's most evident, the one that's closest, the one that's more clear, the one that's more defined in the black community is those fascist pig cops. So what we are saying is if the people can deal with these fools, then we, we would have taken a revolutionary step, a revolutionary leap, I should say. So that's the program that we think is going to move things to a high level. It's going to raise some contradictions. It's going to cause some antagonistic contradictions. We're prepared to deal with them, and we think the people are prepared to deal with them. We constantly and at all times criticized and condemned racism. We always worked with other organizations. We never used color as the basis of our criticism. We talked about power to the people, and that was very fundamental. That is what essentially democracy is supposed to be about. But the media wanted to portray the Black Panther Party as something that white people would be afraid of. Therefore, it portrayed it as a all-black organization that hated white people and wanted to use violence against white people. But once you have that idea of an organization, then anything they say is bad. And anything that can be done to them is okay. Well, you see, the media has played its traditional role. The white-owned, white-controlled media has played its traditional role back then and today. And their traditional role is to maintain the status quo. Status quo meaning white folks on top, black people on the bottom. So the media did the interpreting of what was going on. And they interpreted everything in the light of how it would uh, impact upon the maintenance of the status quo. Still do it. So you can see that there is a correlation between the type of illegal and subversive COINTELPRO actions that the FBI wanted to mount against the party and the image that was created in the media of the party. It's okay to do these things to a group of bad guys. The slave master never liked the slaves to get in a defensive position. He's called Albert nigger and he's lynched. But when you begin to study ways in which to thwart this genocide, these genocidal wars, and come up with ideas, logical ideas, ideas that will work, then you become the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. And if that organization is the greatest threat, then this militant, uh, military apparatus is, is up for grabs. It's fair game. It's all is fair in war and love and war. So you get a coin temporal, a completely illegitimate thing, uh, and it's thrown at you. And you say, well, you can't cry. You know this is a war. And that program was intended to be run secretly. It was intended to be run as a counterintelligence program would be run against, say, Soviet spies, that you spread false information about and among the black group so that they would shoot each other. Well, in California, there was a rivalry between the Black Panthers and a group called U.S. United Slaves. And uh, documents now show that, the United, that, that materials were sent and information given to the United Slaves in an effort to get them to make an attack on the Panthers. And in fact, there was an attack made and two Panthers were killed. The FBI would get hotel stationery, type a letter saying that Connie had met with uh, Huey and David and they were really hostile toward Eldridge and he should be very careful about how he deals with them. And it would be, the signature would be C. Then Connie would get back to Algiers and tell us about her meeting. We already had this letter. And then she'd say, but I didn't send you that letter. So then we'd say, oh, she's lying. In one situation, the FBI used a fugitive named George Sams, and they chased him across the country. And they would raid each Panther office just as he left. But they would use his supposed presence there as an excuse. So the government made it very crucial to their success that it looked as if these things just happened by accident. There was no connection between 
the plan of the FBI and the fact that so many Panthers were